Thank you very much, Duncan. Uh, great to be here. Uh, my name is Paul Duffy. I'm the Vice President of Weissening. I guess I know several of you in the room. I, for years, was uh, a consulting engineer um, in practice and building science. Um, and for the last five years, I've been working um, for Eisenin, which is a spray foam company, actually doing code approvals and work uh, in uh, technical support all around the world. And as a result of that, most of my talks that I give are any, any place but, to, but Toronto. It's always nice to get home to Toronto to speak to a, uh, a group of friends and colleagues that I don't get as much of a chance to do anymore. I really wanted to uh, cover a number of things today, so um, kind of structured the presentation with um, uh, a basic introduction of the, of the topic. Um, I guess this is being one of the earlier sessions, kind of sets the stage for other presentations on various aspects of building envelope uh, uh, design and retrofit. So I'm going to try to cover a number, number of bases there, defining building envelope function and the types of things that are uh, required to, def um, to achieve performance and then um, a means of, of achieving that on a consistent basis. As I said, I'm originally from Toronto, um, so my, my uh, background, like Duncan's, was from the University of Toronto. I graduated a lot uh, uh, <laughs> further back than Duncan, <laughs> um, but uh, I think there's several of the folks on the, uh, on the agenda are uh, ex-U of T folks, so um, it's a bit of a tour de force here, it seems. Um, more recently, been doing a lot of work with the American Chemistry Council. Um, it, it may, uh, surprise many of you folks in the room that um, what you do and how you do it is probably um, among the best in the world and the skills that you have can take you all over the world and you know, I mean, if a guy like me can do it surely there are lots of folks in the room can do the same thing so um, it's been a it, it's been a good ride and a, a chance to see a lot of development of the industry is there a way of dialing this in so it's a little bit more um, compact on on that on the screen yeah, it looks like it looks like we could use a bit of an adjustment on the on the camera. Maybe somebody can can do that because it looks like things are getting chopped off. So um, basically, I wanted to, to to set the discussion talking about the code context for everything we're going to talk about here this morning. Basically, um, code context for anything building envelope related is part five of the building code. And that part of the building code basically defines. What, what's called an environmental separation. It separates the interior from the exterior, from the ground, um, and from environmentally dissimilar interior spaces. So I'm just basically um, paraphrasing things. It's got to be, it's got to be shrunk down if, if there's a way of it. unzooming it. Yeah. Okay. Well, fortunately, you have uh, the printout, so you, anything you can't see on the screen, you can see in your book. So <laughs> follow on, along, if you will, and I'll, I'll try to not get distracted by you know, flipping of pages. Um, so basically, if you look through uh, Part 5, um, it talks about things like structural loads, uh, heat transfer, air leakage, vapor diffusion, um, protection from precipitation, moisture in the ground, surface water, and sound control. And there's a way of looking at the code that basically would be a kind of a one-to-one -one relationship for all of those things that are specifically identified as issues and concerns. You have a, a particular system to address those specific concerns. And the problem I always have in dealing with designers um, who, who are looking at, at that approach, they say, well, um, what are you going to do for insulation? And they've got a product for that. And what are you going to do for air barrier? And they've got another product for that. And what are you going to do for um, uh, a moisture barrier? And what are you going to do for uh, damp proofing? And if you think about it, we're adding more and more layers, um, some of which get along, some of which don't get along and might cause us some problems. Um, I kind of take a different approach where in fact, what we're trying to do is look at innovative ways of combining functions, materials that can do more than one thing, and that can help address several aspects of building envelope design in one fell swoop. And if you do that, 
um, not only is it t does it tend to be a more elegant solution, it tends to minimize the extent to which you have things like double vapor barriers causing problems and, 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 and certain uh, air barrier schemes that work but don't work from a water management point of view. Um, so basically, you know, I'm looking, at, there's a kind of a subtext, if you will, upon everything that I'm presenting here this morning that kind of combines functions where possible, where it makes sense, and basically um, uses that as a way, way of delivering higher performance um, and fun fundamentally at, at, at reduced cost because you're eliminating duplication in, in, in some cases. You can still duplicate functions, have multiple things that resist water entry, um, but it's a conscious decision and you're planning that accordingly. So, um, you know, if you look at the most basic uh, starting point for building envelope design, it's the thermal insulation. So there's a mix of products that are possible. Some products in our building envelope design will be um, classed as insulators. Some of them will be conductors. And understanding how, how extreme various materials are along the scale and how you get the best performance out of those materials is key to delivering good building envelope design. So if you look at insulation products, generally you can um, get, I, I tend to use the old conventional units, R values running from R3 maybe to R6 in terms of overall thermal performance. That basically um, covers the gambit of most products. a fairly tight range for, for, for what insulation materials are, and that's because l largely a lot of insulation products trap air. Some of them will trap a blowing agent gas, like a synthetic material, but otherwise you're, you're into a kind of a, an R value that corresponds with trapped air. The interesting thing as well is if those materials are not fully enclosed and do not fully trap the air, that performance that you see in the textbook doesn't get delivered and it gets, gets you into some of the problems that you encounter in the field. Air moving through many insulation products leaves you with next to no R value at all. And the way I kind of reinforce that in people's minds is think about your furnace filter. What's in your furnace, furnace filter? A fibrous material. You blow air through it, <laughs> it doesn't have any R value at all. It just, it basically cleans the air. You've got clean air that's moving through the wall, but you don't have any trapped heat. Um, and that can be a cause of um, concealed moisture problems, condensation, and the like. And looking at heat flow in another way, flipping heat flow over, you've got conductance. So the conductance of various insulation products, you can see them on this scale here, very tight band, uh, various uh, insulation products. Compare that to wood, Wood is kind of in that range, and a lot of times we didn't think about, you know, wood construction as requiring insulation to protect the wood studs, but now we're starting to get into high thermal performance where you're protecting wood as well because it begins to conduct a fair amount of heat. When you get into glass and concrete, they conduct a lot of heat, so any structural bridging to the outside becomes very, very... Um, key to what's left in terms of heat loss. If we've, if we've insulated everything else, those thermal bridges are going to be much more noticeable, which is why we start to see the proliferation of moisture problems in well-insulated, high-performance building, because the things that are, less become, that are left become very, very noticeable. Put that on another scale and you include steel and aluminum, you can see that the, the other <laughs> things, the other materials that we build with practically disappear in, in terms of heat loss uh, and, 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 and the conductance scale. Um, so, you know, basically anywhere where we have steel passing from the interior to the exterior is going to be a, a problem. And we've got to look for ways of, of making sure that that's kept within the insulated layer. And if you combine that with the notion that air can move through insulation, it would be great to have those materials encapsulated in, mater in insulation that um, basically fully adheres so there isn't air movement around the insulation to cause heat loss and exacerbate this kind of a problem. So if you appreciate the importance of the way you insulate and where you insulate, then that becomes the jumping off point into uh, the de desirable strategy for um, arranging 
uh, the thermal envelope of the building. And so we're starting to see more and more buildings designed with a fair amount of what I like to call continuous insulation. Some people um, refer to it by different products. That's the more generic uh, name for it, but we've, we, it used to be exterior sheathing that was, um, it was called. Um, at the end of the day, uh, there are many, many products that can uh, behave in this way. And so the, the notion is, though, that it's more continuous over structural elements um, to prevent the uh, heat loss through thermal bridging. And that can be done in combination with uh, insulation in the cavity as well. And so now you're getting into much higher levels of performance. Um, and you can appreciate that it's fundamentally important to the performance of things like steel stud walls to have uh, continuous insulation over top of the assembly. Um, and it becomes something that you want very significant amounts of continuous insulation over that assembly. The code actually assesses a, p a penalty of about 30% uh, in terms of the heat loss that would occur through the structural elements because there's kind of a thin effect with um, the uh, uh, metal studs and, and metal framing of all types. And you can see uh, you know, a variety of approaches, a variety of products and combinations that could be done uh, to achieve uh, fundamentally similar types of, uh, of performance improvements. So that's the starting point for thermal insulation. Um, then we have this other uh, uh, requirement of an air barrier. And an air barrier uh, is something that we're all pretty familiar with. It's, it's been sort of the basis of building science since ever, ever since I've been in practice. Um, the notion of how do you make your air barriers continuous um, I think increasingly we're starting to recognize the fact that air barriers resist structural load and have to be structural in nature. So, you know, sheet goods that flap in the breeze um, have some fundamental limitations in that they can't resist high winds, they will have a, de a general tendency to blow apart at the joints, um, and some of the, the forces that are on this aspect of the building can actually be quite strong. So. Um, when you look at uh, uh, wind speeds and so on, um, that calculates up to a very significant load on the air barrier system. So the notion of not only being continuous but being durable becomes a bit of a challenge unless you're dealing with something that has, that's structural in nature or at least adhered to a structural element all the way through the piece. Um, so basically, um, Fundamentally, the way air barriers get de de defined in the code is based on the permeability of materials. Um, um, but I add the design condition of structural support, especially at the joints, and around penetrations. How do you deal with those things in a way that's durable? And, you know, it, obviously there are ways of, of, of addressing this that are uh, very basic. You know, you caulk something and fill a hole. Um, but you might want a belt and suspenders of a, a membrane with a mechanical tie-in and an adhesive tie-in, and it becomes something that gets more and more uh, important uh, as you're looking for longer-term durability and uh, higher levels of performance in larger buildings. And the whole notion of transitions, to, uh, various window types and doors, um, any kind of... Uh, uh, transition from one wall system type to another become, becomes something that has to be carefully thought through. Um, and part of what you're thinking through is the whole idea of movement. So structural movements can occur between walls of various types. They can occur at control joints and so on. So the air barrier design is not just something, you know, stuff pookie in a hole and, and basically um, that, that's my air barrier system. It's, it's, it's something that's more thoughtfully designed increasingly as you get into higher and higher performance buildings. And where you locate the air barrier can have a lot of impact on whether or not you've adequately enclosed, protected, uh, concealed insulation within the assembly. So there is an interrelationship between materials. Um, I just wanted to, before we left this topic, kind of leave you with some notions. There was some work done at the uh, uh, National Research Com uh, Council a few years back. Basically, they looked at different insulation products 
and assessed the impact of air leakage through and, and, and convection within those products. And they found that when you're dealing with fibrous products, you can actually end up with a very significant reduction in heat loss if you haven't thought these things through properly. Basically, um, you're ending up with perhaps as much as 70% reduction. That's pretty significant if you're counting on that to protect your, your steel framing, which is, is uh, a, a pretty significant thermal bridge. And if there's cavities around insulation and so on, you can kind of see where, where the problems kind of crop up. Um, the spray foam systems that I'm involved with tended to perform very, very well in these kind of integrated tests because they adhere to the surface and protect uh, from movement around the insulation as well as having the inherent ability to block air themselves. So not saying that it's the only solution, but you get some idea of the scale of things and, and, and why different things perform in different ways and how you could utilize them effectively in various aspects of your design. So the acceptable materials for air barriers uh, listed sort of in the code are things of sheathing of various types, gypsum wall board, ins various insulation board products, plus a variety of trowel on, peel and stick kind of membranes, as well as spray on foam products. The, the advantage of the spray on foam product is that you get both insulation and air barrier in one material. And you probably will get other, uh, other performance as well, whether that's a, a performance that you want or don't want, that's something that you've got to be aware of in your design. Typically, looking at problems in the field, the, the biggest single, single problem that I see in, in, on a regular basis is misapplication of products, using products um, that have very low vapor permeability as water resistant barriers on the outside, but they also correspond to uh, vapor barriers and they may in fact trap moisture within the wall assembly. So you've got to be aware of keeping uh, thermal uh, uh, performance outboard of some of these membranes and materials so that you get the performance that you want. And of course, you know, when you're dealing with existing buildings particularly, complexity becomes a huge issue. It wasn't really thought through properly in the first place and going back and fixing some existing buildings to add, to sort out some of these issues can be a real problem. And where I usually see it is in testing and commissioning. If you go back and do thermal scans of these buildings, you'll, you'll see lots of gaps and, and so on. Um, multiple air barriers, weather barriers, some of these things can be a good thing, as I said, if they encapsulate insulation within a cavity, not a bad problem. Um, you've got to be very aware of the vapor permeance of those materials as well. So uh, all of these things kind of interrelate. And so the various uh, insulation board products that are primarily used on the exterior have a, uh, have a thermal performance. So um, they can offer some protection to the cavity spaces within um, as well as uh, the insulation uh, of the uh, 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 membranes and so on that might be used for moisture control, air barrier control, and, and that sort of thing. Um, basically, what I find is folks sometimes get, you know, the cavity insulation maxed out. So let, maybe you're dealing with a six inch stud and, and you've got R20 or R3.2 and or RSI 3.2 uh, in the cavity. Um, you'd like to have something equal to that outboard of the cavity. It becomes something very significant in terms of extra thickness of the wall assembly you need to protect and keep that cavity warm. So uh, it becomes a very significant design consideration in terms of how uh, you structurally support cladding materials that are cantilevered off that much. And as I said, many, many of these materials will have a vapor diffusion component to them where they can actually act as a vapor barrier. So you're getting vapor barrier performance on the exterior, which in this climate might be a bit of a problem unless you have a lot of insulation on the exterior to basically keep the interior surface of insulation warm and uh, at minimal risk to condensation. So the location of the vapor barrier is important. The material properties are important. Um, and then finally, uh, um, the whole notion of wetting and drying is important. We're, st we're starting to see in buildings enough insulation being used and enough thermal performance being expected where we not only have to think about protecting a wall from getting wet, but how it will dry. 
Um, so I'm, I'm of, a, of, a, of a school of thought where if you're putting insulation continuously on the outside and you're putting barriers on the outside, you're starting to think about, well, maybe that wall assembly, the, the, the cavity wall assembly, should be drying to the interior. And so you're looking for ways to eliminate things like polyethylene or foil back drywall on the inside to allow a drying path towards the interior. This becomes the challenge as you're getting into higher and higher levels of insulation. And what will work in the particular climate that you're working in, um, it becomes something that has to be studied in detail with some more advanced tools. A lot of designers these days are using computer-aided design tools like Woofy to assess uh, the um, uh, wetting and drying potential at various uh, junctures in wall assemblies to, to accommodate both not only uh, the protection from wetting but also the paths for drying. So um, the final aspect of code uh, requirements basically is this notion of a water resistant barrier. I know we've been pretty dense here on word slides. I want to get into pictures very very quickly and talk about how all these things come together. But the water resistive barrier is the notion of a barrier that deflects water away from the outside. And so there are a number of materials that are, are being um, promoted in this regard. Various types of peel and sticks, uh, trowel on membranes, um, kind of a, a much, much higher levels of performance. Uh, some of them are vapor permeable, some of them are not. If you're going to use a vapor impermeable, uh, impermeable uh, type material, then you've got to think about having enough insulation outboard of that membrane to basically keep that membrane at a warm enough temperature where you're not running the risk of condensation. So the options in code are basically run the gambit from something as simple as building paper up through uh, fibrous insulation products, um, um, that combined with flashings and, and so on that deflect rain away, trowel on membranes, um, um, uh, spray foam on the exterior to, to try and uh, get the whole uh, performance of this as a system. All of these things when you're talking about water resistive barrier, air barrier, have to have very high levels of performance so you have to think them through as systems. The whole idea of, of uh, sealing and, 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 and thinking through all of your joints um, so on so that you get performance as a system becomes very very important. Below grade the equivalent of a water resistive barrier is, is, is a barrier to groundwater and we see dimpled membrane systems and so on being provided to deflect moisture away uh, to provide uh, vertical paths for drainage as well as membranes uh, uh, directly on the structural elements like uh, concrete foundation walls. So that all kind of sets the stage where we can talk meaningful, meaningfully about applications. So let's start from the base and work up. Slab on grade. Basically, in this particular case, uh, we're not going to run into problems with um, moisture in a slab on grade unless water is having a general tendency to rise out of the soil, and that can happen happen in certain soil conditions, but typically the way we deal with it in a slab on grade is we provide a drainage path underneath anything we're talking about in terms of insulation, structure, and so on. So the notion of a layer of uh, free-draining free backfill underneath our insulation layers um, and anything we do on a structural slab becomes key. Um, often the uh, concrete that we use forms the air barrier for this particular assembly, so we start looking at how do we get continuity of the concrete. If we seal that up and the concrete leaks, we basically seal moisture coming into basement and below grade spaces as well as slab on grade. Uh, the function of having insulation outboard of all of this actually works to our benefit in that everything inboard of that insulation will have a general tendency over time to become warmer and drier and over, over time that will become a very durable system. It'll, be, it'll become something that performs very, very well. Um, there are issues with um, uh, materials that are, are, are underneath construction getting damaged. A lot of what I like to recommend to designers is before you do anything, make sure any gravel or whatever that's under the foundation wall, our foundation slab, 
uh, is properly compacted. Compact it, then put your insulation, then put your, your, your um, um, uh, concrete for uh, the slab on grade. If you do it in that kind of a sequence, um, you'll get much better results and you'll get more even, uh, a more even surface for applying either board stock products. Um, spray on medium density foam can, can be sprayed on the, uh, on the ground as well with an air, with the capillary gap of, of, of free draining backfill. Uh, both of those approaches have worked very, very successfully in the past. Um, so the, the big things to avoid traffic uh, prior to and uh, the placing of slabs uh, and, and the avoiding of placing slabs directly on the, on the subsoil. When we start to get into basements and below grade spaces, you have options of going interior and exterior. This is a residential basement. Um, it, it blows up to something bigger when you're looking at commercial. But the strategy of putting insulation continuously on the exterior works really, really well here. One cautionary note, though, if you're using spray foam products or any product, really, um, the, the normal tendency is uh, for these, uh, the, 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 the testing of these products basically tests water absorption for three days, 96 hours. Um, so it's not really assumed that any product like this is going to be a waterproofing for, for a basement or a blow grade space. Really what you need is drainage in addition to a material like this to give you the performance and avoid moisture. Crawl spaces, there's a general tendency to want to uh, insulate crawl spaces up in, the, up in the floor assembly because you think that's where I need it. I want the floor warm and, and, and so on. But you get much better performance if you insulate the per perimeter and you basically turn the crawl space into a, um, uh, a, a heated space that's dry. You'd run poly over, over top of the... Uh, uh, the subsoil, um, and seen this in many commercial buildings as well as, as re some limited residential. Um, the things to avoid there, again, you don't want to use uh, any uh, of the insulation products as waterproofing, so you've got to have a drainage scheme as well. Um, we've actually found that in this context you can use medium density or light density spray foam um, because the the, the light density actually has a tendency to dry to the interior and it gives really good performance. The medium density um, uh, acts as a barrier, so you're, you're assuming that the drying would occur to the exterior or you're applying it on the exterior so it dries to the interior. Then you move into above grade walls and this is where the fun begins. You get all kinds of jogs and, and, and um, weird shapes as, as design is getting more and more um, out there, if you will, um, there, more people are trying to do more innovative things in terms of architectural appearance. It creates some real challenges in terms of doing air barrier, um, uh, water resistive barrier, and so on. Picture using um, sheet goods to wrap around a curved surface, um, trying to cover uh, uh, jogs from one uh, plane in the wall to an out another plane. Uh, and so we start to see a lot of, of spray foam get used on the exterior, particularly for this type of application, basically as a cure-all. But the trouble is, as I, uh, as I alluded to a little bit in, in, in my lead up, is if you haven't thought about how you're going to cover over structural elements, you can have thermal bridges and so on uh, penetrating this really, really great layer of, uh, of insulation. and that because um, steel elements, metal elements of all types, uh, concrete tend to be very good conductors, um, it can be very difficult to get good performance unless you're prepared to be very thorough in covering over those elements on the exterior. And so that pr creates some challenges. And we see a variety of things being done to, con to not only take advantage of the materials as air barrier and insulation, but also as water resistive barrier. So you incorporate things like through wall flashings. This one actually shows um, a, uh, um, a termination bar at the leading edge of the, that flashing. And what the termination bar is, does is two things. If you think about it, spray foam is, is basically applied as a chemical reaction between A and B side. 
Um, and that chemical reaction gives off heat. So some of these membranes, if a little bit of heat is applied to them, will have a tendency to delaminate from the substrate. So the termination bar basically holds the, um, the membrane in place while the uh, insulation is curing. It also um, provides a mechanical interlock. A lot of these uh, membranes have um, very glossy surfaces to them and not, other things don't stick particularly well to them. But if you use little tricks like that, um, you can actually get both a mechanical bond as well as a, a, an adhesive bond uh, to the substrate and tie in one material to the next. It's important to know the characteristics of materials. Um, some folks would look at that as being overkill for a penetration. Uh, basically, if you're going to spray some foam over top of it, um, uh, why do you need to go to that length? And, but, you know, I know other designers who want to be absolutely sure the belt and suspenders approach. They've got the air barrier provided by spray foam in the field of the wall for any specific penetrations. They've gone ahead and, and uh, uh, made sure that they're appropriately dealt with. Here you have up uh, on the top, you know, a structural element that passes from the interior to the exterior. And I'd, I'd hazard to guess it doesn't take a thermographic camera to tell you that that's going to radiate heat from the interior through the wall to the exterior. And you're going to have cold spots on all the structural elements on the inside. And so you could have condensation and moisture problems with projections like that uh, tied in to exterior, uh, tied into the interior framing for support. So the above grade wall, basically, you know, um, I like to suggest that, you know, some of the things that you're trying to avoid, uh, reliance on adhering to glossy surface materials alone. I like the combination of adhesive as well as mechanical interlock of those systems. Um, uh, I, I recommend mock-ups, people doing uh, uh, mock-ups of various intersection uh, uh, schemes to, 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 sh to, to show how they work, to test things out, test out materials, um, different types of membranes and compatibilities with different surfaces and different insulation products and so on. Um, and the whole notion of when you're doing any kind of exterior wall application, having sufficient R value outboard of the structural elements to prevent condensation and cold temperatures within uh, insulated assemblies, or interior assemblies, I should say. Uh, lots of folks will be tempted to augment that continuous insulation with insulation on the interior, so you see um, Folks love to use spray foam to, to plug and fill and seal all these holes. And it's a great product for that. Um, one of the things that I would caution is it's not the only product that you're going to be using for air barrier in this application. You'll have to make sure that uh, where you have built up framing elements or concealed elements that are, are very difficult to get to, there's a way of injecting foam or, or some other material to bridge that gap to keep give us continuity throughout. It has to be thought through in the construction process. Too often I see folks that sort of kind of saying forget about it and come in and uh, foam it up and so solve all the problems. We can do a lot, but we can't, we can't solve everything. And so um, understand the materials and the advantages that they bring to the table. But you can see it is possible after the fact to seal up, you know, framing elements, but there's still an, an, a need for caulking and and maybe single component foams around windows and doors and, and gaps and so on of various types to fully complete out what I call uh, a system for an exterior wall. So um, one thing I haven't mentioned is one of the problems that we run into as well, sometimes folks are running mechanical or plumbing systems in these concealed spaces on outside walls. Always, always, always make sure those elements are concealed within what I call the thermal boundary. So insulation, air barrier, all of that encapsulates and most of the R value is outboard of those elements so that you're not running into problems like freezing sprinkler pipes in drop ceiling spaces or, or plumbing runs and so on that pass through cold spaces and freeze up over time. Um, and the whole notion of uh, thermal bridges are kind of done that one to death a little bit. Um, and one of the areas where a lot of performance uh, issues occur, um, kind of building off the, the, the discussion I just had previously, is the notion of uh, uh, 
um, cantilevered space over unconditioned space. So cantilevered uh, conditioned space over unconditioned space. Lots of folks will use spray foam in those kind of applications. And you can kind of see that that's going to do a great job of insulating in that particular area. But with duct work that that's, that's that far outside of the thermal boundary, we're going to have to use an awful lot of insulation to try and keep that warm and within the, the heated boundary of the, of the building. I think that's a townhouse project. But it does work well to, to insulate and so on and fully adhere it to undersides of cantilevers and, and, and so on to solve some of these building envelope issues. So I've talked the mechanical uh, uh, issue outside the thermal boundary to death um, and the thermal bridge one, so I'll, I'll move on. So then basically the, the next application that I'd like to, to, to touch on is the application of, say, the floor of the attic. Um, and typically if you've got attics that are available, this is going to be wood frame construction. A lot of cases folks will use um, um, a layer of spray foam or a layer of, uh, of material to air seal and insulate. Kind of a great application for light density foam um, because it will seal to all of the framing and uh, truss uplift and movements don't really damage uh, the foam because it's a more flexible version of spray foam. There are two varieties. Light density is more flexible, uh, medium density is more rigid and, and typically used more for this continuous application. Um, cathedral ceilings. Um, lots of po places in North America do cathedral ceilings and they don't, believe it or not, the air seal is so good with, with spray foam products that code doesn't require them to put venting in that assembly. So kind of a, uh, a novel thing, I think, for folks in, in Ontario to think about, but there are lots of examples, literally hundreds of thousands, bordering on millions of examples of folks using um, spray foam and uh, uh, fully filling cavities in, in, in cathedral ceiling applications with no venting above because the foam acts as both an air barrier um, if you're using two pound foam, it'll act as a vapor barrier as well as the insulation that you're trying to achieve. And the more you can fill into that cavity, the better off you go. Yes? Right. Absolutely, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, low density foam typically is a much, much lighter version of, uh, of foam. It's uh, two, uh, the, the medium density foam is about two pounds per cubic feet. So um, cubic foot, picture two pounds. You know it by touching it, you can't really compress it with your thumb. Um, low density is about a half pound per cubic foot. It actually is kind of spongy t to the touch. And you're right, it is vapor permeable. So that material actually would require a vapor barrier in certain applications. What we find designers are often doing in that particular application, say this cathedral ce ceiling, picture it with drywall over top of it, they're specifying a vapor impermeable paint, a, va a vapor barrier paint as the primer for that assembly and that provides the vapor barrier that's needed. So the insulation and air barrier functions are taken up by the spray foam itself and the primer on the drywall is the, is the vapor barrier for that application. Um, um, and I, and, and that, that, that's the common approach here in Ontario because the, the, the a lot of the codes officials are actually thinking that the foam itself has to be the vapor barrier. They don't see it as a, sec a secondary material. 
Um, the trouble is that two pound foam with its higher density has a higher cost associated with it. And um, um, if you can get the same performance out of light density with a vapor barrier paint, um, why go for the extra cost? Sometimes in those drops, in those uh, cathedral ceilings, you have very limited space. And so the other feature of medium density foam that's important to realize is it has the higher R value per inch. So maybe you need um, you know, the, the R6 per inch to basically give you um, something into the high 30s or 40s in, in that, uh, in that uh, cantilevered space because you might be dealing with a two by six or a two by eight uh, roof joist. We've, we've actually done a number of studies on this and we found, no you're not. The one, uh, the one caution that I would suggest to you is areas where you're using peel and stick membranes throughout the field of the roof. Then you've got an extremely good vapor barrier on the cold side of that assembly. Most shingle assemblies basically can allow moisture to move through them and we, we, we don't see a problem. But I would be very cautious about doing something without proper venting for a, um, for a roof where you've put a very good vapor restrictive layer on the extreme outside of the assembly. That, that would be my one cautionary note. Most, most, of the, most of the assemblies that I'm showing here, perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that they have conventional shingles on the outside, so there is a path for drying towards the exterior. But if that's limited in any way, uh, you're right. Uh, you're, 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 you're playing a game of Russian roulette and you don't want to do that. Yeah, I would I would go with medium density in that in that kind of scenario. Good questions. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, there have been a number of them. Oak Ridge has done some of them. Building Science Corp out of Waterloo has done some. Um, they basically found um, less than two degrees temperature difference, two degrees Fahrenheit, which is like a little over a degree uh, Celsius uh, difference between uh, an unvented and a vented roof in terms of shingle temperature. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it because the shingles are on the extreme outside of the assembly. Um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be more or less mimic outdoor temperature with the, the solar additions of the sun. Um, what we found actually has the most effect on shingle temperature is shingle color. So a white roof tends to run cooler than a, uh, a black or a brown roof. Um, so at the end of the day, um, this was one of the early pieces of research before uh, the, the Americans, uh, you know, places like Arizona would, would allow unvented attics to be built without venting underneath the uh, cathedral ceiling. Um, and when they did their due diligence, they found that that wasn't a, a significant issue. Some <laughs> shingle manufacturers will actually still uh, penalize you if, if you're not providing venting. Um, but there, I think there's enough competitors in the shingle game who've actually gotten to the point where uh, if you can't get a proper warranty from some person, you can go to another manufacturer who's willing to warrant it because uh, the, the building science on this is pretty solid. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, all, all my discussion about continuity um, really 
And, and some folks, you know, they, they're really good at inspecting a conventional wall assembly and they know how to go around and inspect poly. You can be a very good inspector of a, of a spray foam job as well. And really what you're looking for is adhesion to the adjacent framing materials because the, the foam itself will be an air barrier provided it's adhered to the adjacent framing elements and it runs continuously in that regard. So um, in terms of uh, approving a job, looking at the, at the work that's done, I, I encourage you to be really thorough and, and look at it. The nice thing is you can have a pretty thorough inspection of the air barrier before you ever put drywall on. You can even do one of those depressurization tests if the building's small enough. Put a, a fan door in the in the uh, in the unit or in the um, uh, in the building as a whole, and, and uh, put the building under negative pressure, and you can actually go around and see whether or not you've adequately sealed before you ever put drywall on. So, the tank. It's an approved building product for framed attics. We've also done um, uh, a number of, 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 of compatibility tests with um, trusses and work closely with the Trust Research Institute and SBCRI. Um, and they have given us an, an evaluation uh, of compatibility with, with their products. Um, so, um, we're at the point now where CCMC is, lo is looking at all this data and evaluating um, uh, their take on it. The American Codes authorities have already approved it for the national code in the U.S. So um, the research has been done. Yes? I would. Um, the term bar is something that we have uh, have recommended. Um, a lot of our competitors do as well. It's not a it's not a code requirement. Um, I think you get the best performance. Um, some folks have had issues with peel and sticks not adhering to certain substrates. So various manufacturers ha of, uh, of materials will have primers and so on that they recommend as well. You won't get the warranty on the product unless you've primed it properly. Um, so the primer and term bar is the solution that works best as far as we've seen. The whole notion of using a peel and stick coming up underneath, is that what you're... Right. Yeah, I would think I, I would think that that's challenging, and I, I don't I don't see why you would need a peel and stick in that application, um, because basically um, there's no risk of condensation in that assembly. So you know, at the end of the day, part of the reason you do the peel and stick is to, is is for air and vapor control, um, and and part of the reason you do it on vertical and, and uh, horizontal surface is for uh, bulk water control as well. I'll just march on a little bit. I know I'm getting long in the tooth here in terms of the presentation, but hopefully the questions have been helpful. Um, basically, I, I wanted to cover one base before we kind of left the, the applications and how things change with retrofit. Um, usually in retrofit, there are certain design objectives that get layered onto um, uh, any kind of a retrofit job. Things like minimizing the disturbance in occupied areas. So you tend to do solutions that go out board of any of the finished spaces on the interior, which is a good thing because you, if you think about it, you can work in some design details that give you continuous insulation as well. So sounds like in concept that that should be a really workable solution. Um, it should allow you to correct a comfort or a, a structural issue at the same time. So obviously, uh, the things that put uh, cladding, uh, building envelope uh, repairs into hurry-up mode are things like the need for cladding repairs and so on. So you, 
You've now got a cladding job that morphs into a building envelope repair, that morphs into some corrective design and so on. It becomes a, a bit more complicated issue. There's always the desire to minimize costs, so you, you want to use something that just basically uh, encapsulates, solves the problem, and, and we button it all up and, 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 and walk away and forget about it. Um, and you would like to reuse as much of the existing elements as possible. So let's say you're dealing with one of these apartment buildings that you see, you know, going down the 427 or, um, you know, in some of the older parts of Scarborough or whatever. Um, there would have been significant deterioration of the brick and slab edge and, and, and other um, structure ele structural elements in those assemblies. Um, to go to simply go over them is going to be a challenge. Um, and moreover, even if they are good, are you going to trust in the long term that deterioration is not going to continue and now it's concealed from view and, and you have perhaps another problem to figure out? So there's some, some real challenges that I think folks have in doing retrofit work that are unique to that endeavor and there, there's some additional thought processes that go into it over and above anything that I've, I've suggested here. So um, generally when I, when I see retrofits, I, I, I see three different trends. One is sort of like a, what I call a, a surgical repair. Folks go in and they know that they've had a problem in a soffit, so they open up the soffit and they, they do some stuff, rumble, 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 in, in, a, in a concealed space and put everything back up and, and try to solve it. And that can work really, relatively well if it's an isolated problem and the building's relatively new and you're really trying to correct things to a standard that would have been accepted uh, at the time of construction. Um, it's going to be more of a problem if you're dealing with a structural problem uh, over, superimposed over top of a building envelope problem. You've got other kind of repairs that you've got to keep your, your, your thumbs on. Um, so working in these kind of uh, areas like attics to plug holes and, 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 and solve air barrier issues up uh, elevator shafts and things like that. We see a lot of those kinds of things done. Um, typically folks are using kits for those kinds of things, not the, the full spray rigs that, that I've, uh, I've kind of shown here. Um, but uh, there are spray foam solutions that uh, are, are truck based in, in sort of larger volume. Um, the uh, next category of, of repair trends that I see um, work on the entire exterior. So basically what you're trying to do is introduce a continuous insulation layer outboard of um, the existing structure that's there. The problem is that most of the cladding systems that we have here will either be vented in some way, um, so like a, a, a brick will have weep holes and, and so on. So you're going to defeat all of the moisture control that was originally designed into that system and you've got to replace that with a new kind of vented, wept cavity space outboard of anything that you provide there. And you've got to verify that the material that you're going over is structurally sound and is going to stay that way in the longer term. So it's, it's, it's a challenge to get a continuous insulation fix with air barrier, water resistant barrier as part of that fix. Um, and there's often a need to do some structural stabilization as part of it. And I would superimpose on that the additional thought of Okay, if you're going to build all this structure outboard of it, you're going to create new thermal bridges through the assembly, and there's likely to be very little thermal um, um, performance inboard of that assembly. So there might be heat loss to anything steel that you use as a as a structural tie-in, and so on. Con consideration has to be given to how you structurally isolate those elements as well. And the final one that I see a, a lot of is moving the thermal boundary to um, basically solve a problem. So um, we've got problems with folks who've gone and retrofitted ducts in drop ceilings and cavity spaces, um, attic spaces. So if you move the thermal boundary outboard of all of that, basically you bring all of that duct work back into the interior of the building and you basically avoid a whole host of moisture problems associated with that. So you can see kind of where 
folks come to us asking for spray foam solutions to do that kind of thing. A bit of a challenge. Um, it's a significant change in design. One of the things that we find with this kind of uh, fix particularly is folks are bringing materials into the interior space that used to previously be outdoor, uh, outdoors. So think of what goes on in attics. You know, raccoons get in them, squirrels, bats, whatever. God knows what is there existing <laughs> that you're bringing inboard once you, you air seal and, and so on at the, at, at the roof deck level. And whether or not you vent it and so on, that's another, another issue as well. But I'm just assuming that you've moved the thermal boundary up around to encapsulate those things. Um, it's really, really important to do things like eliminate all insulation in the intermediate plane. So if you're moving, at, if you're moving at, uh, insulation to the uh, underside of the roof deck from the floor of the attic, basically you want to remove all the insulation on the floor of the attic. Why? Because if you don't do that, basically all of the environment in the attic doesn't become within the condition boundary, within the heated space. It's, it's somewhere in between, somewhere between interior and exterior because you've got insulation here that's going to be much more effective because you don't have air leakage to the outside. And you've got insulation up there. And you've also got this contamination of, of maybe, uh, you know, rodents and vermin that have been there over the years and you've got dust and, 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 and all the accumulated stuff from the great outdoors that you, you'd like to make sure all of that stuff gets vacuumed, taken out and, and, and uh, uh, removed from the interior of space before you even contemplate doing things like that. So there's a few cautionary notes when, when you're doing retrofits, particularly some of these changes. These are the common ones that we see using the products that we use. Um, we can give you advice on how to do that kind of stuff successfully, and that's part and parcel of what we try to do in terms of selling our products. So, um, fundamentally, um, I've gone through the whole notion of the, the, the different separations that are required. I think what we're starting to see is a number of materials being used that provide more than one feature of separation as part of the material. Um, integrated solutions where there's transitions from, say, a board stock to a spray foam or a board stock to a peel and stick or a spray foam to a peel and stick or, or whatever. Some folks are still doing um, um, solutions that will be reliant on um, a moisture barrier separate from an insulation product, uh, the kind of belt and suspenders approach. Um, I like the notion of the insulation being fully adhered to that surface, come what may. Basically, I think it gives better performance and avoids the, the, the thermal bridging and the structural elements. So the notion of integrating performance in the assembly, I think, is a, is a trend that we don't see going away at any point in the near future. Basically, by selecting materials that, that are capable of performing more than one function, uh, builders and designers get the benefit of simplifying some of their designs to minimize cost or provide some redundancy. If, that, if it truly is a key area that you want some redundant performance, you're designing that in from the outset. So air impermeable insulations, uh, medium density foam as part of the um, water resistive layer and so on. And then finally, in terms of the retrofit projects, much more attention to detail, um, to focus on pre-existing problems. Um, the re repair strategies will be less than ideal, so you've got to think th through how are we going to um, be able to verify ongoing maintenance of structural elements and so on, what, whether or not we've stabilized things properly.